Secondly, we see quite a fast rising profit share compared to previous periods. So the share of national income that's going to profits compared to, uh, to wages is another generalized trend. We see then I think a major sort of pattern of wage repression at the global level. So even as wages in developing countries increased, uh, that increase was not in line uh, with rising productivity. And I think the final sort of major characteristic of the system that we see is, is very much a, a stagnation of real investment within the advanced capitalist countries themselves uh, as, as real investment was gradually shifted towards the developing countries. I, I think that hugely intensifies over the last decade with the wholesale shift of investment and industrial production to China developing East Asian countries. So I, I think the, the, key, the key point here is, uh, I think in terms of crisis tendencies, I mean, a growth, growth of global productive capacity, but very much uh, separated from the growth of global uh, consumption, especially in the US. And this neoliberal growth model, and I, I think there were two previous crises preceding the one which uh, the, the East Asian financial crisis was a precipitating factor, which, uh, and, uh, and the dot-com stock market crisis of 2000. But really, the, the way out of this, that crisis within the system was this huge expansion of, uh, of credit and debt, and especially uh, household debt. And I think fundamental to that was the recycling of the export surpluses within the global system, and from China, Japan, to a lesser degree, into uh, much increased household borrowing in the U.S., the U.K. in particular, and Canada's a, a sub-point here. But basically, we see in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., consumption levels rising much, much faster than wages, fueled by this huge growth of uh, debt. And, uh, and of course, this, uh, this was fed by the financial sector developing new credit markets, so the asset bubble in the housing market, the stock markets, but fueling that growth of debt. So in a sense, I mean, you can look at financial deregulation as consequences of the subprime crisis and, the, and how that broke apart as a precipitated cause of the crisis. But I mean, what you have to bear in mind was it was that growth of credit that did keep this growth period alive through the, through the 1990s and set the stage for the crisis, and you know, to my mind, was, was unsustainable. And uh, I think, you know, this kind of unstable, um, unsustainable growth model was, was sort of kept going by central banks, uh, uh, concerned to, uh, to get out of the, the dot-com crisis and, and a complete abdication of any responsibility for, uh, for managing the financial sector and its uh, excesses. So now that the, uh, the system to, has, has uh, sort of exploded, we've gone through the global slump, I, I would argue that there's not going to be any reason easy or uh, immediate or even medium term uh, return to that model as it existed at least through the 1990s. I think we're in a, in a context where private investment is going to be extremely weak because of global overcapacity, the hit to profits. Uh, private consumption growth is going to be extremely uh, weak. I, mean, I think you see this especially in the United States, I mean, uh, but also in Canada. Any any recovery that we've experienced has been, I, I'd argue, due almost entirely to the extraordinary fiscal and monetary measures that have been put in place. And, I mean, that is the big difference from the Great Depression. I think uh, government sort of did at least uh, intervene to sort of stop this going into a downward spiral, which has bought us a bit of uh, time for how we get out of it. So I think the, the challenge now is, uh, is to develop a, a new growth model, or as I say more ambitiously, a new economic model. Uh, so my time's coming towards an end, so I'll, I'll just flag some key points and we can come back to them. I think firstly that there is the need to, to re-regulate uh, finance uh, in terms of regulating the kinds of products, the, the leverage of banks and financial institutions, the whole high risk bonus culture. Uh, I, I think a lot of that uh, re-regulation has to be done in a coordinated uh, way between countries, uh, just given the, the realities of, of a global financial system and regulatory 
arbitrage. Uh, some of that is, is underway, but I suspect it's falling off the agenda very quickly. Is there some sense of uh, kind of normalcy returning and the people responsible for this re-regulation are the same central bankers and finance ministries who, who sat on their hands for the last 50 years, so whether they're up to the job remains to be seen. I, I think it's uh, essential um, that we rebalance uh, the dynamics of, of global growth. Uh, it's kind of a huge and daunting task. I guess the G20 have sort of handed this off to the, the IMF so we can have uh, some degree of skepticism about what will take place. I, I think uh, clearly what we need is, is some uh, uh, reduction of huge uh, trade and financial imbalances as between China and developing Asia on the one hand and the US in, in particular the other. I think you know that will demand uh, major currency changes uh, in terms of the uh, ending the peg of the Chinese currency to the US dollar. Uh, the thing that's really daunting, I mean, consumption is only about 35% of the economy in China. Wages are an extremely low share of income. Uh, those obviously, I think, have to be greatly expanded and increased for rebalancing. Um, but it's pretty hard to see how any feasible path of growth of consumption in Asia is, will be sufficient to offset uh, major declines in the US and UK. So I think that's going to be a, a huge uh, challenge. Uh, but I mean, I, I think the whole sort of expansion of bargaining rights for labor, democratic rights, social rights are going to be globally are going to be an important part of their rebalancing. Uh, obviously, we, I, we need to sort of reconnect productivity gr growth with wages, in a, uh, which I think is primarily done through unions, other labor market institutions, labor standards. Uh, much easy, easy to say, much harder to do, but I mean, unless uh, I think we fundamentally turn our backs on this deregulated labor market model that has been imposed. We won't get out of the uh, out of the crisis. And I, I think we're in a period where, we, you know, even if we, uh, as we will, I'm sure, we'll continue to live in a in a capitalist world. I think uh, I think investment, new investment, is is only going to happen if there's much more government intervention in the investment process. So certainly I would see, in the interest of system stability, a very strong case for much higher levels of public investment, uh, deficit financed in, in the period ahead. I mean, some part of the economy at any time has to be expanding based on, on credit growth, and it's not going to be private investment, it's not going to be consumption, it's going to have to come through uh, public investment. I think public investment can be hugely productive in and of itself and crowd in private investment. So I think some combination of expanded public investment with planned private investment, particularly around the, the green economy, if you want to call it that, moving to more sustainable energy paths, I think there's a big role for private investment, is going to have to be a, a major part of the agenda. I, I think to resolve the jobs crisis as well, we also have to look at uh, a major expansion of, of public and social services uh, to create lots of jobs at relatively low levels of spending, uh, jobs which I think are going to be desperately needed. So 